Uh, so today we have Emil here from Novoic. Um, would you be able to go over the overarching um, uh, vision of what Novoic does and yeah, and, and a little bit more about yourself? Yes. First of all, great to yeah. be here. Um, and I'd like to speak a bit to that. So, so in, in Novoic, we are predicting brain diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and depression from the way that you're speaking. And we believe that in the future, the way that you have your brain health checked should be as easy as having a conversation. So right now we're sitting down and doing a, a podcast, which is quite a <laughs> sort of um, a, a, a fitting format, I guess. In, in, yeah. um, by the time we finish, we've, we've had maybe 20, 30 minutes of conversation. Uh, and now imagine that that was all it took for you to have your brain health checked for the year. Now we're seeing interesting that the way that we are interacting with the digital world, with our devices, but also just the way that we are talking as human beings is through voice, through dialogue, and we're using those data streams to predict neurological diseases. And now we can dive more into the details of why that actually works and mm -hmm. what is sort of the, the, um, the precedent there. But it turns out that there are actually changes in both the words that you say, but also the way you say them that occur when the brain gets impacted by disease. Mm. And not only do you see those in the, the sort of later stages where you have clinical symptoms, but they'll actually be there in the very early prodromal symptoms of uh, stages of disease um, up to decades before a clinician will pick up them in, wow. in, a, in okay. a clinical setting. That's interesting. I mean, I mean the, there are many ways to, there are many modalities to um, assess neurological mm -hmm. decline. I mean, I think the most notable would be like cognitive tests you kind of get in, uh, in the hospital um, yeah. or the, uh, yeah, in the hospital. But, um, you know, wh wh why do you think um, speech is, this, is a stronger modality to kind of assess cognitive decline? So, um, for us, I, I think an interesting parallel to, uh, to what we're doing with, uh, with voice now is what we saw in the field of oncology, so cancer, mm. with next generation sequencing. And, and to give a bit of background there, um, next generation sequencing was a new methodology for uh, sequencing genetic information, getting genetic information from, um, from people. Mm. And you've very famously had in, in the past, if you look at what was the cost of getting and the whole genome was sequenced, it began by being in, I think like multiple millions. Uh, and then it came down very rapidly over a, uh, a number of years with the advent of next generation sequencing. Mm. And now what that eventually enabled was first of all, to do with the existing use cases in a way that was cheaper, faster and more efficacious, mm. but also really it served as a basis on which new industries, new markets were built where, <clears throat> Um, we've really reimagined what you can do with that type of information and one of the things that that led to was a revolution in personalized cancer care where um, you're seeing today now that we actually have a handful of really efficacious cancer drugs uh, getting out into the market where there's previously been a, um, a complete lack of those and mm -hmm. one of the things you saw in cancer were that originally we were defining cancers by the organs so you'd have prostate cancer mm -hmm. or lung cancer you have um, like, like, like cancer that, that were confined to a particular area of the body. Mm. Um, but it turns out that's not really how cancers work. Mm. Uh, and, and there was this really big um, sort of landslide change where, um, where the company Merck, they got approval of a cancer drug they have called Keytruda mm. to work pan-cancer. So no matter where in the body the cancer was based, mm. if it had a particular genetic profile. Mm. And the way that, um, that genetic information fed into that was that we are now able to um, to better profile in a very fine-grained way the mm. online symptoms and genetics that the patient have and not just the overall um, category that they fall into. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen a similar problem, um, I think, in the area of neurology where you'll be diagnosed with having Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or schizophrenia mm. or, or be lumped into one of these big buckets. But really being an Alzheimer's patient is not just being an Alzheimer's patient. There's a number of different pathologies that can lead to the disease. It's probably more a bucket of different diseases. And one of the things that has been holding back the field has been an information bottleneck. So really lack of information in, mm. in the field. And that is why, for instance, in the Alzheimer's field, we don't yet have one single proof treatment that works in modifying the disease. Mm. Now, what we're seeing in the area of, of, um, of neurology with information about the brain, there has been a slight decrease in the cost of information. So if you go back 
a couple hundreds of years, the only way to really get information as a, as a doctor or clinician about the brain uh, was to wait until someone got a brain injury and then you see where was the brain injury, how did that affect their behavior, and use that to infer mm. um, what area of the brains we were doing what. And then it came down with microscopy, PET scans, MRI scans, with um, CSF samples, with now a blood test that's in, in development. But we haven't had that inflection point yet. Mm. And, and we think that's going to come with digital modalities of different types, but particularly with the, with the vocal modality, where mm. um, that is certainly going to make existing use cases cheaper, more efficacious, and faster to administer, mm. but also really serve as a basis of reimagining how we're looking at these diseases, where instead of just going in and say, well, this is a patient with Parkinson's, mm. you can go in and begin to look at, okay, what, what is the cognitive impairment versus the motor impairment versus do they have um, particular symptoms with agitation, mm. and get a much more fine breakdown on what is the underlying profile that a patient has so that you can better target treatments. Mm. And then we are suddenly moving into the territory of having more personalized medicine, which is also what you saw in the cancer field, where better targeting the genetic defects that are um, mm. associated with the particular cancer a patient has leads to much more efficacious drugs. And, and, and we want to do something similar in the area of, um, of neurology. That's incredible. I mean, it, it, what was the germ of the idea? Uh, I mean, I believe you. This kind of came about came by during EF, right? Or, or, or did you have the germ of the idea before you went into EF? Yeah. So it the the at least the germ of the idea actually precedes um, EF quite a bit. Um, okay. And I I have a um, I think I can pinpoint quite finely in time when um, the first sort of seed of that that sparked. Um, Mm. which was a number of years ago when I attended a conference called the Brain Prize, uh, which is based in Denmark. It's like the Nobel Prize for Neurology. Mm. Um, that was for me at that time a, a really great opportunity to just interact with some of the best minds in, in, in the field. Mm. And one of the conversations I had at that particular um, conference was really transformative in um, sort of where I eventually ended up taking my academic career, now my professional career. Mm. And that was when I learned about it's a... Um, it's a particular study that was done back in the back in the 90s. It's called the Nun Study, um, and in the Nun Study, a group of nuns had agreed to donate their brains to Alzheimer's research after they died, mm. and they were all living in the same monastery, and they were living there for 50 years or so, and then mm. eventually they would pass away. And a researcher came to the monastery to to run the study on mm. um, brain aut autopsies, um, but what what he also found while he was on the site was an old archive of autobiographical recordings that mm. the nuns had to write when they entered into the monastery. Yeah. And that, so, so that, that would be um, about 300 words on where they were from, mm. uh, how did they do their education, why did they decide to join the monastery. Mm. And the, the really interesting thing there was that they were, they were writing these um, autobiographies at the point they entered into the monastery, yeah. so about 40 to 50 years before the eventual study was done. Mm. And what they did was they took those autobiographies, gave them to a group of linguists, and from analyzing the language of those, they could predict four to five decades in advance who would go on to develop Alzheimer's disease later. Wow, okay. Which is like, like, like it, it, mm. it sort of really, really gets you, gets you thinking. For me, it was also a, like a wow moment. I, yeah. I, I had a, a couple of, of, um, of sleepless nights after that. <laughs> um, but, but it makes sense if you look at the pathology of Alzheimer's in particular. So, so we know Alzheimer's is caused by a, um, it's a pathological pro protein that you have in the brain called mm -hmm. amyloid beta mm -hmm. that will begin accumulating, um, some evidence suggests, all the way back when you're in your early 30s. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. And then you'll have this slow accumulation over several decades. Yeah. And eventually you reach a point where the brain just can't cope with the load and then you have a rapid decline of cognitive symptoms. And that is usually the point where it becomes apparent to families, to patients, and to clinicians when you take them into a clinical setting. Mm. But, but obviously there's something going wrong in the uh, disease pathology much, much earlier than there. Mm. And, and, and that is sort of one rationale of why it makes sense that there are these early changes in, in speech. Mm. Um, so I, I guess that, that was the very, that very was, early yeah. um, germ. It's something that I've been um, that I've been working on on the side of my research um, for, for quite a while now and, yeah. and then came to London, came to EF to set up a company around the space. Yeah. And, and this is where I met my um, great co-founder, um, Jack Weston. Yeah. Uh, now he comes from a particle physics background. So he was working with this 
very large uh, LHC style particle accelerator in Chicago, yeah. um, analyzing very um, very large noisy data sets. Yeah. Um, but really interesting for us of sort of the same type of data that you get if you take a voice recording of someone. And, and mm. so we, um, we came around the idea um, and sort of the space out of um, said a shared passion for the impact that we could um, that we could have there. Um, we've both personally been affected by um, dementia in our families, and um, particular Jack's story is quite um, it's quite impactful. Where mm. his grandmother developed magical dementia, and he saw over a um, a number of um, of years how that affected her. Mm. Really interestingly, she was originally Finnish. So her first language was finished, she then later learned English. Mm. And now what he saw happening was that first she gradually unlearned her English until she could only speak Finnish and then gradually unlearn her Finnish. So he'd sort of seen firsthand how you get those changes slowly accruing over many, many years before you get the more severe symptoms. Mm. Would you be able to kind of talk about like the type of data you've had to take in to build your models and you know, basically how you built your data set currently? Yeah, so, so the, to, to do disease prediction based on speech, you obviously need data that's paired with disease diagnoses yeah. and um, speech and or lang language data from, mm. um, from patients. And now we've been working with a, um, a number of both leading clinicians um, to, to work with some of the academic data set that are out there, mm. um, but also going out there, running a study on our own to collect at scale this type of, of data to be able to um, to have a larger data set um, mm. internally to, to predict on. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, it, it, uh, how, how much does like diversity kind of play when it comes to accruing your data set to build the models you need to build um, mm. and to kind of put your research into action? Yeah, I, I, that is an extremely important question, mm. particularly because one problem we've been having in medical research up until um, the last five years, or mm. probably still, is, is there's been a very big bias towards the what's called the white default male. Mm. So you see most research studies being done on men, mm. uh, typically from European origin and typically white, mm. and that really limits the how generalizable the results are. And, and we've seen over and over again how this played out into, um, say, drugs that don't work in women as well, or, or, um, or different ways where unrepresented communities are not getting catered for by the scientific research that's going on in the medical field. Mm. So it's something that's very top of mind for us, mm. um, in addition to data that span really from people all the way in their 80s, 90s, but also going back when they were in the 50s or even 40s. Mm. Because you do obviously want to have a wide span to be able to see how, how first of all, how early do these patterns emerge and how do they potentially change over the mm. duration of, of the disease progression. Mm. Now in terms of dialect, in terms of language, uh, it is a really interesting interesting um, discussion because there's obviously differences in taking a language such as English or Latin based language and then going into Mandarin which has a completely different yeah. initial structure of, of the language. Yeah. Um, now, now for us, um, one of the things that are important for making this work at a broad general scale is that you are analyzing a lot of different patterns that really change across both the um, the words that you're saying, so the content, the semantics of what you're saying, how you're structuring your language, so mm. syntax, grammar, mm. but also how you're producing language. So phonation or even the motor component you can pick up on tremors in, say, Parkinson's from, from the vocal cord. Wow, okay. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah, and, and, and now the thing is that, say, okay, what if you had a slightly different accent? What if you were tired? What if you had three beers because it's a Friday? Right? Right. We, we don't want those type of things to be what influences how the, the predictions are eventually made. Mm. Um, and the crucial thing there is, is really that when you're looking at, at many different patterns that are changing at the same time, mm. you might expect, um, say, being tired to affect the speech of your language, mm. um, but it wouldn't affect all the other components that we're looking at in a way that's consistent with having a particular disease. Mm. So it's really looking for that vocal fingerprint across different patterns that enable us to do very high fidelity prediction early on in the progression. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, yes. uh, and I mean, the depth and the nuances of your product seem really complex. Have you learned anything um, about building your product throughout the EF process and where you are at now? Yeah. So I. I, I say the biggest learnings that we have in that phase um, was really who we should cater the initial product to. Yeah. Um, 
So we went through a lot of customer development, figuring out who would be the early adopters. So um, essentially, um, first seeing, okay, is this something that consumers would be comfortable with interacting? Because mm. um, we have you know, great channels for, for collecting audio. Mm. Uh, but then through saying, okay, if this were to work in a GP setting, what is the type of product design that would need to be in place for that to work mm. um, and then eventually going into now what is our, our first initial market which is in the pharma and the clinical trial industry where um, like really working closely with pharma companies, with biotech companies to figure out what do they want that initial product to look like in a way that's the most beneficial for them. It's been something where there's definitely been a lot of product flux over that um, duration. Okay. That's that's really interesting. So, I mean, have you have you guys are you still in the process of figuring out the demographic of the audience you're trying to cater your algorithms to, or um, has that already happened? So, in terms of our research, we've now today completed two proof of concept studies in uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, yeah. proven out the technology platform there, and those have been based in um, so English-speaking um, people primarily. Mm -hmm. Now we are thinking about how to scale across languages, so we are setting up um, now a global consortia collaboration um, with multilingual um, research groups to look at how are uh, the language patterns that you are observing different in, in the different languages mm -hmm. and, and how can we generalize across them. Yeah, that, that, that's a mammoth task right now for you. I mean, um, in terms of uh, going throughout the EF process, I mean, mm. I've, I've spoken to quite a few uh, EF grads. H how has that been? Because um, th there's been various levels of success acro across the board in terms of the people we spoke mm. to. But sure. um, yeah, w would you be able to talk through your EF process, how you found it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. sure. Uh, so I found the EF process absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that it gave me was Jack, my co-founder. <laughs> I, I, I think that's really the their strongest value proposition that they have. So, mm. um, you know, I came out of Oxford University, Jack came out of Cambridge, and, mm. and we, we sort of had this conversation down the road, but what we both observed was that you have a very high density of extremely brilliant people mm. at both places. But there's not necessarily that many people that you would want to found a company with. Because mm. you need someone who is of course, brilliant, but also someone who is deeply committed to going out there, like passing up whatever other great opportunity that they have mm. to take a big risk on founding their dream. Um, mm. And then the persistence and the grit to, um, to actually follow up on that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's much fewer of those people than there are brilliant people in, in the, the, both those places. Mm. So, so what EF does in bringing together every year 100 people who are, first of all, Mm. technically gifted but also who are committed to founding a company. I, mm. I think that's that's very very strong. Mm. Was there a thought process in terms of um, uh, co finding your co-founder because I mean <laughs> do you know when you I mean one of the most amazing things about EF is you're in a highly curated environment um, which is an absolute dream for somebody looking for a co-founder but then you have the other dynamic of do you know what um, there's people selling themselves um, and then eventually you're going to have to weave through all of the mm. bullshit and kind of figure out, do you know what, who's my actual, who, who's going to be a great fit for me? I mean, how, how did that process plan out for you specifically? Did you have to go through a couple of co-founders before um, finding the love of your life? I guess? Uh, I, I actually know it, it was love at first sight. Right? <laughs> so, 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 uh, um, dive, 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 dive a bit into, into that. Um, so we are an atypical EF founding team, I guess. Mm. Um, so what happened with us is that uh, before the EF program kicks off, mm. uh, before the, sort of the, the Love Island of EF begins, they mm. have this romantic getaway where they take <laughs> everyone to, um, this year it was in, um, in a college in Cambridge, and then have a weekend of socializing and just introduction to the program. Mm. And now, I obviously came prepared, so I'd made a list of the 12, 15 people who were everyone in the cohort that I could imagine co-founding with. Mm. Um, now Jack had made a similar list of 15 people, everyone that he could potentially co-found with. Uh, and and the, so the kicker there was that Jack was not on my list and I was not on Jack's <laughs> list. Uh, so we went out with these cured lists and was talking with people being very, very method, um, methodological. Yeah. But then in one of the evenings of, of the, um, of, of, the, of this weekend, uh, we had an introduction made by a, a mutual, um, also a friend of Jack, um, who talked with me. It's like, 
I'm definitely not the, the person for you, but I do know, know just the guy. Mm. And she then brought me and Jack together. And from that moment, it was like all this methodical thinking basically went out the window. So we just like sat down and began talking about the idea and about the space and what we could do together with so the, mm. the technical uh, skills that he was bringing to the table. Mm. Ended up talking for many hours late into the night, just got up next morning on a Sunday and began working on it straight away, which is basically what we've been doing since then. That's incredible. That's incredible. It's quite, quite, um, yeah, um, quite um, romantic. For, um, for, for <laughs> yeah, I think we, we were both a bit romantic. <laughs> Um, in terms of, uh, would you be able to kind of talk about the AI sector um, in the, I mean, during the entrepreneur, in the entrepreneurial world, there's a lot of, you know, AI eating software now. Um, I mean, would you be able to kind of go through, you know, how AI is kind of impacting the healthcare space and um, kind of, you know, nurturing companies like yours that are looking yeah. at things from a first principle standpoint instead of a symptomatic standpoint? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's really interesting to, to track the development that we are seeing now in the, um, in the pharmaceutical and in the biotech um, mm. industry where we're now getting what I call 3.0 or 4.0, depending on how you're breaking things down. Mm. Um, so what you saw initially in the, um, in the pharma industry was that pharma companies actually emerged out of chemical companies that were producing chemicals. Mm. And they happened to just stumble on uh, some, some compounds that turned out to work very well against particular diseases. And that sort of began the first era of drug development where uh, literally the way it was being done was that you would get samples of soil from like the ground, and then you just screen through thousands and thousands of components to see if you had something that stuck. So basically a spaghetti on the, on the wall approach. Mm, mm. Um, and this sort of evolved to the point where uh, pharma companies would pay their employees if they were going on, on holidays to like a certain place in Japan to mm. bring down specific soil from there or from like all over the, all over the world to find these new combines. But you were basically just doing a mass screening approach. Mm. Now the second step there became a bit more targeted. Uh, you had companies such as Vertex that began uh, doing what's called rational drug design. So trying to find, this is the target we want to go after, mm -hmm. this is its structure, this is how we think a molecule can fit into that structure, and then rationally designing those molecules. Mm -hmm. the, the problem there was, what, what sort of turned out is that no one patient are the same. So as, as we touched on for, for the field of, um, of cancer, you have different genetic backgrounds, nutrition, lifestyle play, plays a big role. Mm. Um, and really being able to better tailor or cater the, the, the drugs and the medicine, both in terms of what you're trying to target, but also the doses that you're giving to patients. Mm. Um, it, 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 it's, it's really more um, involved than that. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that you're seeing now in, in so the newest revolution, the, you call it the, the 3.0, where medicine is increasingly being personalized. Mm. Now that fit very nicely into the final step, which is either 4.0 or you can lump it into the 3.0, where medicine is also becoming more digital today. It's becoming mm. more data driven. Mm. So you're seeing increasing now that um, pharma companies have been collecting large amounts of data, uh, healthcare systems have been collecting large amounts of data on patients. And while we're not completely th there yet in figuring out what we can do with it, there's certainly a lot of potential if um, or when we get to the point where we can better understand the nuances of, of that data. Mm. So we're seeing increasingly that um, sort of clinical trials that are being run are becoming more personalized, centered around the patients, they're becoming digitized, um, they're becoming much more data driven. So you have this um, sort of big data approach where you can analyze vast amounts of data to try to find patterns of drug efficacy in mm. particular patient populations. Mm. Now, a really interesting development that's also happening um, is that of digital therapeutics. So, essentially, software as a drug, yeah. where you can actually go in and treat a disease with just a um, an app or a different type of software um, component, which mm. is something that is particularly impactful or, or useful for either chronic diseases um, or for neurological diseases, where we know the say the adherence to medicine or just the way that you are conducting yourself in terms of lifestyle are hugely important factors in the field of the neurology also looking at the treatment that you are giving today is often for the say the psychiatric disorders mm -hmm. will be um, conversation with the psychiatrist it will be cognitive behavioral therapy and and some of these components can be partially productized into a um, a software where you will have much higher frequency interactions with a patient through the software because you don't mm. need to have that clinician in the loop all the time. Mm. So, so that's another, I think, really interesting area to, um, to watch and it's certainly something that 
overall the personalization, the being data-driven, AI-based, um, and also this digital therapeutic approach are, are things that all fit into what we are doing mm. now. Yeah. So we are. Um, we usually say that we are a digital biotech company, and then um, the next thing I say is I go on to explain what it is because because no one ever heard of it. Yeah. Um, but what, what we mean by that is that we are a company that's operating in between two different spaces. So mm. we are a software first company, we are building software products mm. and we are very much operating like a software company in the way that we have. We run agile processes and we mm. have developer teams and that are building out all the products. But at the same time we are operating in, um, in a space and in an industry where you need to have strong scientific validation, you need to work with um, partners that are in a um, somewhat regulated in a, a highly concentrated in terms of market power industry. Mm. Um, and, and finding the balance between those two is one of the things that, that we've, we've, um, we've been thinking a lot about. Because mm. you do see, you see, see quite a lot of these um, digital uh, health companies that is taking an approach where they will um, say go direct, direct to consumer with an app for um, treating insomnia and then instead of saying well we have a new treatment for insomnia they'll say this is something that might impact your sleep patterns. So, like, mm. they, they'll structure their claims in a way so that they don't have to get regulated and they don't necessarily have to substantiate their mm. claims very strongly mm. which is a fine line to, to balance obviously mm. because for us doing um, diagnosing or detecting the early signs of a disease for someone can have a major impact on how their life um, are going to progress, how it eventually turns out. So for us it's very important to be sure that there is solid scientific evidence beneath what we're doing. Mm. So navigating that with also um, wanting to scale this up as fast as possible, especially on the software side, so we can impact the most people, um, is, is a balance that we're we working on. Mm. I can imagine, I mean, extrapolating product market fit in, you, in what you're trying to do must be extremely difficult because you kind of have to get the regulation, you have to get regulated partners on board initially. And that's kind of the component that software companies or the component software companies really don't have to deal with generally. I mean, unless you're in the healthcare space and you're trying to get regulated. Um, I mean, how is that different? I mean, how have you found that process, uh, you know, from going through EF and now kind of progressing forward? Sure. So, so there's, there's a first point to be made that we, um, for, for the first um, product that we're building out and, and our initial um, approach to engaging with the ecosystem, mm. um, we are going very much for the, for the R&D industry. So mm. it's working with the leading pharma, biotech players and also academic institutions globally to um, really enable them to work with this new data stream that's going to be at, at the core of, um, of medicine of the future. Mm. And in that process, we are gathering um, a, a, um, a very large amount of clinical grade, mm. high quality data, um, working with some of the best names in, in the industry. And, and really for us, that is what um, later um, was sort of the basis and enabled us to go mm. to regulators and then have an approved test for say, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, mm. ALS, MS, and, 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 um, and, and so on. Mm. Um, but it's important for us that the first step that, we are, that we're taking is not to say, well, race around step to get FDA approval because I think we've seen a lot of AI based imaging companies both for cancer and for mm. the brain that that just unfortunately died in that process of getting there because it turns out that it takes longer and there's a lot of hurdles that you need to, mm. to clear and um, so, so we've tried to not go direct for that approach but but initially going after the after the R&D industry. Mm. I can imagine I mean in a fairy tale world you know five years from now I mean or even longer because this this is likely to take longer, I guess. Let's, let's uh, bet on five years. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, do you hope like your technology could sit on something like an Amazon Alexa and can kind of just diagnose people in the home, um, you know, and, and kind of, you know, pick out a neurological decline at scale? I mean, would you be hoping, you know, in a, in a fairy tale world, your technology software can just sit on top of a voice assistant one day? Yes, so, so we are looking to maximize the access and the impact of the technology that we're yeah. building out. One thing that's particularly attractive about voice is that the access is so easy. Mm. There's access channels being built out on smartphone devices, so we're building out there now mm. voice assistants, smart speakers, and voice is just becoming the way that we're interacting mm. with, the, with the digital world. Mm. And so, so we are certainly looking to see if we can leverage those access channels. There's an important, see, Precaution there that, that I think is going to depend a lot on how the um, medicine industry is going to develop over um, those next couple of years mm. where um, 
obviously what, what we don't want is to, if you say, um, hey, uh, Alexa, um, when, it, when is my, um, when is coffee with, um, um, with, with, my, with my friend, whatever. Mm. Uh, and then Alexa comes back and say, oh, hey, it's at 12. And by the way, you have Alzheimer's. And then just <laughs> it leaves you there. Yeah. Uh, be, because it's, it's, a, it's a big thing to yeah. tell to mm. um, then patients. Um, which is also why, why initially we want to, we're not just running the test on people who come and ask, well, can, can you run it on, on, on us? And well, we, we could, but this mm. is something that needs to be run by a trained clinician who can, in the case of diagnosis, sit down with a patient mm. and then um, talk through what that actually means to them. I mean, mm. the, the, even though that, that the medicine industry is becoming more um, data-driven and AI-centric and you hear about AI doctors taking over doctors' jobs, mm. there's still that incredibly important human component because mm. humans are humans first. Mm. Um, so, so figuring out how, how to deal that and make sure that everyone is taken proper care of mm. um, when they're interacting with our technology is something that, mm. that is important to, um, to, to get done properly. Mm. Um, now that might mean that um, you will have this from say the age of 40, you will have it on a, um, whether that's on, on an app, on a smart speaker, collating the, the very subtle signs of medical disease and then maybe when you go to your doctor then they'll have be able to see how your um, sort of voice has been uh, declining over these different diseases and then they can have the conversation. Mm. Or maybe we'll be at the point where this more decentralized uh, healthcare approach, more mm. consumer centric is um, accepted and we have proper um, proper systems in place to deal mm. um, deal with with, um, with this for people. Mm. Um, but, but depending on how that, that's, that's going to play out, um, the, the deployment of the product is, is sort of going to be, be set based on that. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, your company right now, um, yes. would you be able to kind of highlight where your company is at right now? Um, whether you're raising, not raising? Um, and, and yeah, just basically talk about how far you've come from a product standpoint and, and where you're going sure. from now. Yeah, so we are, we are racing at the moment. We're racing our seed round. Uh, mm. Been doing that for um, for for a couple of weeks now, and and and, um, and hopefully looking to close towards the end of the year. Mm. Uh, we have built out the uh, the majority of the of the back end of, of the product. So uh, essentially, what that looks like in, in the first iteration is a stack of APIs that covers the entire voice journey. So um, to be able to use voice for doing um, predictions or for anything useful, really, mm. there's a number of value adding steps you need to go through, which covers. Um, capture, transcription, diarization, denoising, deliberation, um, sort mm. of extracting features, and then up to the, the final level, which is the symptom trackers that we are, um, that we are building and mm. then validate on, on, on the platform. Mm. Um, so so we, we've, we've got, um, got the most of that backend built out, and now we are building out visual ways of interacting with that, um, with that backend. Mm. In terms of other big things for us at the moment, we are hiring uh, our so our first initial team, uh, which is that's really exciting for us, yeah. bringing together, uh, as I mentioned, digital biotech, trying to bring together people from mm. the software, from the neuroside, from the AI space, from the, from the clinical side, mm. to just have a world-class interdisciplinary team. Mm. Okay, we can go into the quick fire round. Um, uh, most valuable purchase under 100 pounds? Uh, Rebump subscription. Rebump subscription? Yes. Would you be able to go into that? What is yeah. that? So it, it's a it's a Gmail plugin that allows you to automatically follow up with people if they don't answer your emails. Really? Yes. Wow. I, I think it's it's ten pound per month, but I mean that's definitely the most valuable thing we've we've had. <laughs> I, I didn't know that existed. Yes. I mean, yeah. to to all the entrepreneurs out there, get rebump. <laughs> um, is there a book that you've been gifted that you found particularly valuable, um, or is there a book that you would gift to a fellow startup founder? Yes, um, I would give the Daily Stoic, yeah, um, or one of the other like, big reads on Stoicism. So that could be Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. It could mm. be some of Seneca's letters. Um, so for me, Stoicism has played a big role in shaping how I'm um, like dealing with with high stress scenarios. It's probably one of the best um, mental models for thriving in high stress environments, where mm. it. So, so, so one of one of the um, of the things that um, that people who um, will listen to this will know, um, particularly if, if they uh, have have had exposure as an entrepreneur, is that it's it's at times it's an extremely intense job, and you're facing tremendous um, mental yeah. pressure. And sometimes the working hours can be can be very long, um, and 
just dealing with your own mental ecosystem and be sure to keep that in a healthy place is something that is extremely important to um, to have done, mm. just to take, take care of yourself, take care of your team. There's something that's particularly important if you're the, um, so the CEO of the company. Uh, and for me, one of the things that's been the strongest in helping me do that has been um, readings and, and writings from the, from the Stoics. Mm. That's incredible. And, and what's the most valuable advice you've received in business or outside of business? Mm. I, I say we, we've got quite, quite, a, quite a lot of good things um, in the EF process. Uh, I personally, the best piece of advice that I've, I've been given personally is to go and meet people in person. Interesting. Um, okay. And, and, and that, is, that is particularly on, on, the, on the sales side. So in the industry that we're um, initially selling to, um, you need to meet people in person, oh. um, which is something that we got from, from one of the advisors that we have on board now. And I like, immediately from, from the day we began doing that, I felt a step change in the, um, the speed we've had on the, on the commercial side. Oh, really? Okay, that's incredible. And um, uh, is there a failure uh, you've had in your life or along this process, or actually along this process that's kind of in hindsight set you up for success? Ah, that, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I, I think Jack and I had a quite a um, sort of um, illuminatory um, day, a moment where um, it was about in the middle of the EF program. Mm. Uh, and at this point, we were very deep into the idea that we would initially be building a product for mm. TPs, like a smart speaker sitting on the table, and then um, that would capture the conversation and use that for, for predictions. Mm. And we had talked with know, like 50, 80 um, people in, in that industry and I felt like we, we've been we've got some um, some pull mm. uh, but maybe it was a bit like dubious in in, 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 in hindsight and, and we sat down with an advisor um, that, that, that we had at that time um, from from the entrepreneur first program and walked her through what is the um, sort of where we are what are we trying to sell what's the go to market and she just looked dead stare us in the eyes and said this doesn't make any sense <laughs> and we're like, what? I mean, this is our like am amazing um, like uh, idea, a baby that we've been now like so like laser focused deep down into. Mm. Um, but we came away from that and just had a like one-on-one -on -one conversation, and and actually it turns out like there was a lot of truth to that. Mm. And eventually, after we went out of of um, of trying to go into that industry and, and and where we're selling into now, we've been feeling the real market pull and. Like, when you feel that like you're not in doubt at all, like mm. if you think, yeah, I, I think it's there, no, it's not there. Like, mm. like you, you, you're going to to get get pulled mm. so strongly that there's not going to be single doubt. Mm. I think for us that was quite a strong moment to just say, well, you need to have strong beliefs because you are steering a ship essentially, and, and you need to inspire employees and and, and also not change the direction um, all the time, mm. but at the same time be able to. Um, Stop out, think about what are our current hypotheses, what is it that are the foundation of our beliefs about the business. Mm. So what we're doing now is that we have um, what we call the something we call the hypothesis tracker, where we write down all the hypotheses that we think are true right now. Mm. And then um, what we do obviously is go back, revisit them, try to deconfirm them, um, mm. because if you can kill those, then you're going to save yourself a lot of pain down the line. Mm. That's incredible. And um, what gives you the most joy as a founder? Hmm. So I'd say it's being able to I have two competing ones. I see what gives me the most joy as a founder is to work with my current team and to be interacting with both the, so my co-founder Jack, our first employee, Martin, and um, the advisor that we have on board, and everyone that we've been meeting on the journey who've been extremely supportive, like no matter how they, um, they're getting involved, everyone generally wants to help the best they can, have good intentions, and they're so excited about what we're building. Oh. And really for me, being able to give that deep meaning to, to everyone we bring into the company, oh. to everyone that we interface with is something that's been extremely given oh. so so just like having had hundreds of of extremely um, sort of yeah, yeah com conversations filled with goodness in mm. a way and, and it, it, it's been it's been a really gratifying um, gratifying experience this has been amazing thank you so much for being on our show um, yeah and we wish you the the most success uh, along this journey thank you so much thanks a lot for having me and likewise for for the podcast <laughs>